here with the superintendent of Franklin Regional, Dr. Jamie Pirano, and the superintendent of Earl School District, Shannon Wagner. We're here today to talk about prescription drug abuse and to have a brief discussion about how prescription drugs and how drugs affect kids in the public schools in our area. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let's, let's talk real briefly uh, about your education background. Uh, Dr. Pirano, why don't you start with uh, you know, where your education uh, career started and where you are now? My education career started actually out in York County, even though I'm native to Westmoreland County, uh, where I started as an emotional support teacher. Moved to, back home to the Latrobe School District where I was a learning support teacher, assistant high school principal, elementary principal, assistant superintendent, and now I'm here in Franklin Region as the superintendent. I started in the Penn Hills School District actually as a chemistry general science teacher and uh, moved my way through to be an assistant principal in the Penn Hill School District and then an assistant principal in Borough School District where I then moved up through principalship, assistant superintendent, and then now I'm the superintendent of schools in Borough. Can you each talk uh, just a little bit about how you see prescription drugs and prescription drug abuse as a problem in our schools and what the effect is to learning? Prescription drug abuse has replaced what I um, experienced as a child and what you experienced as a child in the high school. Um, I believe that um, it has be it's an accepted thing among the kids. They see it as normal and um, they see it as an accepted part of their social life at times and then it permeates into the high school and affects their uh, ability to focus at school, their ability to study, their ability to have uh, good peer relationships um, and then again affects ultimately affects their academic uh, performance and who they will be in the future. So Dr. P, um, as, as uh, Shannon said, it's something that's accepted. Does that acceptance outside of school and inside of school affect what goes on within the district? And then what goes on outside the district, does that affect what goes on inside the classrooms and the learning environment? Schools are really a microcosm of society. Uh, when there are issues such as prescription drugs, and as Shannon said, they, they really have become accepted. It's the mindset that it came from my doctor, and because it came from a doctor, that it's okay. It's not the, the typical street drug that you might buy from the, the dealer on the corner. So issues surrounding addiction and abuse of those drugs, they don't stop at, at that gate. They don't stop at the schoolhouse gate. And, we, and the issues manifest themselves in school in a number of different ways. Attendance and truancy, academic performance. A lot of times when kids are coming to school, they're not coming to school ready to learn because of outside influences that serve as a distractor. When you look at home environment sometimes, when there are addiction issues, whether they be prescription drugs or, or alcohol or any other, other form of drug, it's not always conducive to, to promoting academic achievement. You also take a, a look at behavioral issues. Uh, a lot of times the struggle that kids are having with addiction either in their own personal lives or that of their family members manifests itself through behaviors uh, that we see in school. And really as a school system, what it does is it takes your focus, your resources, and as opposed to being purely focused on academic achievement, they begin to di diversify and break that focus and have, you know, have to deal with those issues that, that are coming in from the outside. You know, I think so many people in the public uh, view our school districts as really, truly, and honestly a, a safe place and a place where their kids uh, can learn and nurture and become the, the young adults uh, that they'll, they hope they can become. When, when I hear words as a parent like safe and accepted when we're talking about prescription drugs, tell me, does that cut across demographic boundaries? Is there a particular, uh, is there a particular age where this starts? Is it, is it, is it something that, that affects all students in all districts? I believe it's something that affects all students in all districts and I believe that it's something that uh, knows no socioeconomic boundaries. Um, do students start the use of the prescription drugs starts later 
middle school, high school age, um, but there are no boundaries in regards to who you are, who you're going to be, or what you bring to the table. Um, all, I believe that all students are involved in, in it at some level. Um, not saying that every child is doing it, I don't want to come off that way, but I believe that it, the potential for any child to do it is there. So the, the big question, right? I mean, what can we do differently? Hmm. What can we do differently to stop this? One of the things, uh, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some parents in, the, in some communities, uh, or some people in some communities, really have looked, you know, we talked about prescription drugs because they come from a doctor being okay. But also when you think about issues like alcohol, and parents will think that, that the use of alcohol is a rite of passage. And that essentially, when I was a kid, I drank alcohol and I was fine. If I take their keys, I, I protect them and, and that's okay. But what we fail to realize in adolescent development, the kids or adolescents naturally step over boundaries. They, they've been doing it since the beginning of time. And so when, when those adolescents are, are told the boundary is alcohol, they take that ne next step. Or now with the legalization of marijuana in, in Colorado, uh, and you know, parents who may have, have utilized marijuana uh, when a, in a less potent form in their you know, earlier days, their kids are saying, it's legal there, why isn't it legal here? And we're setting the boundary of marijuana. And kids naturally will step over whatever boundary has been established. And so when, when I look at that, the biggest thing that we can do as a community is say, no is no, and, and here are the boundaries. And that we establish those boundaries, and it really is a systemic or societal core issue that, that we need to come to terms with. As we talk about, uh, you mentioned alcohol, there, there are a seemingly uh, an endless supply of, of new problems that, that you deal with in your districts. And uh, one that's recently been approved uh, for, for uh, distribution is a, is a substance called palcohol, uh, which is a powder form of alcohol. Uh, there, 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 there are any number of ways uh, that we can, that we can uh, you know, help kids uh, understand what their, what, what, what their consequences might be for their actions. What I think we need to focus on is what, what ways can we get to the 5, 10, 20 percent of kids that aren't going to do it right on their own. There are any number of programs out there that, that are helpful to the 80 percent of students that are, are going to make the right decisions. But how do we get into the hearts and minds of the parents and the kids that are in that other group that are, are, are inevitably prone to making the bad decision. What do we do about that? I really think outreach uh, in, in a lot of ways. And when we look at it, we look at staff, students, families in terms of our approach. And so one is educating our staff when, you know, when you talk about, about alcohol and uh, those types of things. Educating our staff about what's out there. Uh, for instance, in a recent in-service day, we had, uh, we had some some experts from the, at the county level come in and talk to, to our staff about one, signs and symptoms, which we've looked at for years, but also what are some other things that we can be looking for and uh, for kids and their use around some of these new products, the, these new, uh, new drugs. And so, you know, educating our staff. When we look at our students, we started at a young, young, young age uh, we use St. Vincent Prevention Projects who come in to work with our elementary and middle school and our health curriculum is strongly focused on drug and alcohol prevention. But when you look at, at why people and get that 20%, why do they behave the way they do? One, environment. Two, mental health needs that they're self-medicating. And the third is adult connections. So we, you know, as a school system, one of the things we can do is work to build better connections with those individuals and, uh, and uh, build relationships. And when you look at the 40 developmental assets that talk about the, those attributes that when kids have them, they're less likely to engage in high-risk behaviors. Adult, adult relationships and, and active involvement in their community, church, 
or school system are key factors. And then finally with parents, we need to, you know, as we look at it, we reach out to parents, we attempt to educate parents, but it's getting that 20% into your, into your doors to educate them. And we need to do a better job of figuring out how to do that. Shannon, as parents, what, what do parents and, and leaders in the community need to be looking at specifically? What do they need to be paying attention to to make sure that any issues are caught early uh, or a child that's exhibiting warning signs uh, is, is uh, given the right attention? We need to make sure that um, people are educated, as uh, Jamie said, between the police force and the um, adults. Many of us have parent advisory committees they, that are uh, connected adults to our districts that then are out in the community as advocates or key communicators for us, but then also as our eyes and ears in the community. Those people need to be educated in such a way that they can also be aware of what's going on in the community and then also communi back, communicate it back to us and to the police so that we can make sure we're proactive with kids and get them with the, the, get to them. Um, the mental health issues um, are, are a huge part of what Jamie is talking about in that 20%. Mm -hmm. And uh, getting to those families and um, helping them to understand uh, the destructive behaviors that are occurring, I think is a huge part of what we need to do. And again, it diversifies what we do as school districts because our job is to educate kids. But unfortunately, the reality is that we need to get out and be where they are so that we can partner with them because they will not, many of those will not come to our school. They don't see us as the partner. Um, they don't see education sometimes even as valuable, which we all know that, that, is, that need, that's a, a belief that needs to be changed. Well, and I think you bring up a good point. You know, in the world of zero tolerance, in the world of legal liability, uh, what is the role of the district in not just perhaps punishing somebody who's distributing drugs and doing it wrong, but really treating somebody who otherwise may have a lifelong addiction yes. problem? consistently across districts the not only the evaluation but also uh, of that problem but also ensuring that they follow through and partnerships uh, we have a partnership and I know you have partnerships mm -hmm. as well uh, our partnership is with Gateway Rehabilitative Services where we try to remove those barriers that may exist uh, for kids that have less supportive environments or or less means uh, to provide counseling drug and alcohol counseling in the school uh, so that way that transportation to and from isn't an issue just in closing, from each of you, what message do you have to a child, to a parent, who's scared to come forward and say, I need help? What's your message to them to encourage them to step forward and fix a problem before it becomes a life-changing problem? The, the message is they have to communicate. They have to come and talk to somebody. They have to not be afraid of consequences or um, uh, being known, being um, outed, for instance, for any kind of labels, addiction or label, labels. Um, they need to come forward and know that the next 80 years of their life is dependent on the choice that they make today. And they have to make a choice for education, not a choice to continue in destructive behavior that will, not, will never allow them to have the life that they truly deserve. So who in Borough School District specifically would a student or a parent reach out to? Um, any teacher, any um, guidance counselor, any parent that's in our building, you can reach out to them as well and they will find the right person, a principal, any adult that's within our schools, I believe, is a responsible person to come to to get help. And then we do the connection with family services or the gateway uh, rehab that you mentioned um, or the um, local uh, counseling services or whatever is available. But we all have those kind of things in place. Dr. P, your message? My message is that there are, are alternatives to engaging in, in the high-risk behavior. And there are kids and families who, who don't do those types of things. And it's about making choices, uh, important choices in, to, in terms of who you're with and what you're doing and, and what, what we accept and expect from ourselves and for, from, our, from our children. And that we're here to help you. We're not here to judge you. We're here to help you in terms of, in terms of making the right choices or you know, if you feel your risk or you're engaging in high risk behaviors, use us as a resource. And who at Franklin Regional should students or parents specifically reach out to? 
any connected adult that they have within a school system is appropriate uh, through through our, our, our safe safe committees or our student assistance program we can provide any adult can provide you the right resources within the school. So whether it's a teacher that you're connected with, a counselor you're connected with, or a principal, reach out, talk to them. And then we will work, as Shannon said, to make sure that we get you whatever help and assistance that you need, whether it's both internally with support in school, as well as those external resources that, that can help, help you. There's one more thing you wanted to say? Yes, I, um, my grandmother, uh, always said to me, never be a victim of your circumstances. And uh, in the um, situation that I grew up in, if I was a victim of my circumstances, I wouldn't be sitting here today. So I think it's about making those choices to communicate, to not be a victim, because if you stay where you are and you don't realize that other families exist that are not like yours, then you'll never get, you'll never break that chain or break that cycle that exists. So you cannot be a victim of your circumstances. Thank you both so much for your time and insight this morning. Thank you. Thank you for having us, Eli. And we will be back after a short break. Did you know that Act 16 of 1999 honors one of the greatest leaders in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives? The Matthew J. Ryan Legislative Office Building, once known as the Capitol Annex, is located next to the main Capitol building and honors the late Speaker of the House, Matthew J. Ryan. Those who visit this building will observe the magnificent architectural designs providing eloquence and grandeur to the building. Known as one of the greatest members in the history of the Pennsylvania State House, Matthew Ryan started his career in the legislature in 1963 and was elected speaker in 1981. His charisma and knowledge will forever be reflected in the building now named after this great legislative leader. Now you know. Continuing our conversation about the prescription drug abuse problems in our state and also highlighting the fact that April 26th is Prescription Drug Take Back Day, we're here speaking with a family member, Sarah Siminski, who has dealt with this in a very personal and emotional way. Uh, Sarah, thanks for being here. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Why don't you just tell, uh, why don't you just tell us a little bit about who you are, where you come from. We're both Franklin Regional yes. graduates. Yes. Um, I grew up in Murraysville, um, graduated from Franklin Regional. I'm currently a school teacher. Um, I'm involved with this epidemic and problem because I lost my sister. Um, she was 23. It's hard to believe it's been so long um, when she passed away. And um, I have a lot of strong feelings about this issue. And um, it really needs to be addressed. And we need to understand how dangerous it is. Can you tell the story of what happened with Megan? Yes. Um, my sister was someone who was very normal, I guess you could say the word. She was a cheerleader, tons of friends. She was a group of, giant group of, part of a giant group of girls. Um, went to college, WVU, did really well, but um, all throughout this, no one really paid attention to the fact that you know, they were partying and involved in things that were not safe. I mean, that's, this is glorified now, this let's take some pills, let's drink, let's be out of hand. and. We're partying, and it's, it starts really young, and it started really young with her, too. And um, in high school, prescription drugs, they, it was, wasn't just her. It was that big group of girls. Um, they were taking it, drinking, taking from parents, taking, you know, whether it was medication, alcohol, um, things like that. But she was able to keep things under control. She, like I said, she went to college. She graduated, um, but she was still involved in things, and unfortunately, um, her involvement in this prescription drugs and things like that led to her experimenting with things that were a little more dangerous. And um, unfortunately, after she had been battling, she being clean, going to rehab, things like that, she made the choice to use again um, in November of 2010. And she um, had an overdose 
and um, my mom found her in her bedroom, her childhood bedroom, which is heartbreaking. Um, and um, th that was it. It was one time for her, and she's gone now for forever. My, my son's not going to know her, and um, I miss her. My mom misses her, and it's her friends miss her. Her, everyone misses her. Everyone she touched misses her, and it's because of all this stuff. It's because of this abuse, and it's just heartbreaking to see. It can, it could have, and can be prevented for others, and it could have been for her. But I like to focus on what can be done now, not so much, you know, looking into the past to fix things that we can't change. So, well, so you had mentioned that uh, what your family went through really started with some minor experimentation right. with things that people think are safe because mm -hmm. they're drugs that come from a doctor's office. Right. Uh, are you aware of in, initially whenever uh, your sister's experimentation with prescription drugs when it started? Uh, where was she getting them? Was she buying them? Was she taking them? I think it was a variety, to be honest with you. Um, in my home, I know growing up with my parents and things like that, it wasn't readily available to her. I don't know what was available to her with her group of friends. They were teenagers. They, Teenagers are sneaky by nature. Um, so I don't know where they were coming from. I do know that she occasionally would purchase things. So it was, I'm pretty sure it was a combination of taking things from parents who were unaware um, and also purchasing things as well. Um, some of the recreational stuff she would do would be, oh, let's drink a little bit. We took a Vicodin, we took a this, we took a that. And it, you know, it's, it's a doctor prescribed it, it's not dangerous. She became really ill the one day and I had a really tough conversation with her about that and um, thought that was the end of that one. I really never knew where we would be years down the road, but. Um, so Sarah, you know, a lot of people uh, who are going to start taking drugs, who think that they're just experimenting with safe pharmaceuticals, uh, I think a lot of times they, they think very self-centered in that they're just doing it to themselves. They're just, you know, if, if there's a problem, it's only affecting them. Uh, they're going to be okay. Why is everyone worry so much about this? Why are they making it a big deal? Um, and I think I mean, I know and, and, and you know from firsthand experience that that's really not true. Can, right. you, can you talk about, uh, and I know it's a very painful subject, but, but what your sister's, uh, what your sister's uh, history of, of drug problems did to you and your family? Yeah, um, it's, I've had to be the person, my, my father has since passed away. Um, he was very ill. Um, going through this entire experience was being my sister. Um, so my father's passed away, so my mom and I are kind of left, and it was, you know, that's sad enough right there that our unit of four is now two. Um, so that's hard to deal with. Um, you know, I have my family now um, with me and my husband and my son and my mom, and um, it's really hard to think about just how much things have changed and what it's done to everything. My son will never know my sister, and my sister and I were, I mean, we were friends, we were sisters, we were closer than close could be. We did everything together and it, it breaks my heart to know that she's not going to be a part of his life and vice versa and I'm never going to get to hold her kids. There's things that go on in my daily life that I should be excited for and I get, get excited about um, and it makes it hard. Other family members doing fun and exciting things, getting married, seeing friends have kids. In the back of my mind I'm always really sad about not having my sister around. So when people are making these decisions, I, I, I was speaking with someone about this earlier, people are making these decisions to use and to get involved. Um, they need to, it, it's, it's, it's a mental health issue and it's something that they need to reach out and get help with and you, you, you can't handle it all on your own. It's not all about you and getting better and in using. And you need to remember those, people who are using need to remember those who they're affecting as well. I mean, not only themselves, um, they could be taking their life, but the, the, the aftermath that they leave for their family members is something I would not wish upon anyone, 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 ever. Well, it's, so. I mean, it's truly something that, that affects families, it affects communities. Right. Uh, you know, I, I think that probably everyone uh, who lived in Murraysville uh, went to Franklin Regional uh, within five or six years of, uh, of when your sister graduated knew either you or your sister. Right, and, right. and so I think everyone kind of saw the effects uh, of, of, of this. And, you know, uh, 
it's not like uh, it's not like this this problem is is just something that affects uh, low income families or a certain demographic. Uh, it's something that affects everybody. And what do you see if you if you if you would have seen a a path, uh, you know, whenever your whenever your sister uh, was first getting involved in in, in drugs. If you would have seen a path, what path would there have been to prevent her from doing what she did or to help her from doing what she did? Um, a lot more resources, um, a lot more awareness, resources to help people who have fallen into that, I guess, trap you know, of addiction. Um, because once you fall into addiction, um, you need a lot of help getting out. It's, I like to say it's, you think of a glass of water when you're doing watercolor and you know before you clean your brush the first time the water is clear and you put a drop of dark paint and it just changes everything. Um, that's how I like to think of addiction because it changes everything about the person that's involved. Um, their character changes everything like that. So something in looking back at what could have helped her on that path, something that could have more intensively gotten to her and made her feel more empowered and strong um, to know that she could go through it. But I, I, an underlying thing that I think we need to look at is a lot of people who experiment, we know a lot of people who experiment, some people can make it out unscathed, others can't. Um, and we need to learn how to help those people who, who can't make it out, whether it's because of mental illness, addiction history, things like that. Um, we just need to be there to support them, and I'm not really quite sure what the way that is. Yeah, some people think it's more, more criminal prosecution. Um, I'd like to think that more mental health and more addiction services, um, being aware and not pretending like it doesn't exist is going to be a really big key, too. Um, we, need, we need to be aware of how, how much of a problem this is in our community and look, look out, question. I know I question my sister. My mom gets mad at me now because I question her all the time. But I questioned and I knew, what she, I knew what she was doing. I knew when she would lie to me. Um, and that's the big thing is that I wish I would have questioned a little bit more too. Well, what, what message would you have for a parent, for a young, uh, young adult, a teenager who knows there's a problem, knows that maybe they have a problem or someone they know has a problem? What, what's your message to them for what to do? Um, for people who are involved themselves, although I'm not someone who's an addict, I would say that I would like to send the message that you don't deserve this. You don't deserve this life that you're heading towards. You're stronger than this. You don't need the substances to compensate for whatever you're trying to hide, because that's usually what it is, whether it be sadness, fear, anxiety, trying to fit in. You don't need it you can do it on your own. And I think everyone needs to look into that inner strength for themselves a little bit more. That's what I would say to these young people and even adults that end up falling into this. Um, for people who are aware of it and are seeing it happen, um, a lot of the times they're afraid to confront people and they're afraid to accuse and they're gonna lose the person um, that they're accusing. And um, you know, pushing somebody away because you know what they're doing and you call them out on their behavior and offer them help and let them know that you're not going to sit idly by and let it happen might be the best thing that you do. Because by ignoring and by pretending, you're enabling most of the time. Um, you're enabling to stay in your home for them to take more things from you, take money, sell, pawn things. I mean, I've seen it all happen. And to, to ask questions and to not hide from it is my biggest thing because I see way too many people who have been in similar situations to me that look the other way and it 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 that's it may it turns my stomach because I can't I can't look the other way I'm really bad at that and I, that's my biggest advice well I, I appreciate your willingness to to talk to the people of Pennsylvania about the, the issue that your family went through in hopes that we can try to make some headway on this epidemic of prescription drug abuse and drug abuse in yes. our communities. I wish I could do a little bit more than just this, but whatever steps I can take, I'm glad to help. Sarah, thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you for having me. And we will be back uh, after a very short break.
Did you know that the main entrance to the Pennsylvania State Capitol building is home of two bronze doors that each weigh over one ton? As the primary entrance to this beautiful architectural building, the bronze doors signify the many accomplishments and sacrifices endured throughout the history of the Commonwealth. The magnificent archway over top the doors contains a portrait of William Penn, founder of the Keystone State. The upper panels on the doors commemorate the forming of our nation with the signing of the Declaration of Independence and Constitution. The bottom panels depict the laborious industries of the Commonwealth, including coal mining and agriculture. Now you know. We're continuing our conversation about prescription drug abuse here in Westmoreland County and we're joined by some law enforcement. We're here with retired U.S. Marshal Tom Fitzgerald and the current Chief of Police for the City of Lower Borough, Tim Weitzel. Gentlemen, why don't you tell me a little bit about your law enforcement background, how long you've been involved, and uh, uh, just a little bit about yourself. Uh, I have uh, 40 years in law enforcement. I started as a dispatcher with the Pittsburgh Police Department. Uh, then I spent uh, 28 years with the Allegheny County Police Department. Uh, with 18 years of that being as a homicide detective, uh, promoted to the superintendent of the Allegheny County Police Department. I uh, retired in 2000, became the chief of Murraysville from 2000 to 2002, where I was then appointed uh, as the United States Marshal of Western Pennsylvania by President Bush. Tim? I have 17 years experience in law enforcement. Uh, started part-time in the borough of Verona in the township of Upper Borough. I was hired in Lower Borough in 1998 where I served as a patrolman uh, and the department's accreditation manager which ultimately uh, gave me the opportunity uh, to ascend into the, the rank structure. got promoted to lieutenant in 2012 and ultimately became the chief in, later in 2012. You know, what, one of the things we're trying to discuss today is the effect of number one drug abuse, prescription drug abuse specifically, but also uh, diversion of prescription drugs and how that leads to problems in our community. Um, Chief, can you talk real quickly about uh, what you see in terms of drug problems? What, what percentage of crimes uh, that you get involved with are drug-related problems? And then also, what, what number of them start with prescription drugs? Well, starting from the bigger picture, working back, a large portion of what we deal with in Westmoreland County, in Lower Brown, New Kensington, Arnold, stems from drug activity. And much of it at this point is stemming from, from heroin abuse and heroin usage. And that all ties back to prescription drugs, but you know, on the, where you may become victim, victim of a person who is a drug user of heroin is because they then engage in property crimes they're your likely house burglars that are going to come into while you're working, steal your gold and pawn it at the cash for gold places, um, you know, to go buy stamp bags of heroin. And uh, most recently, we had a one of our unmarked uh, police cars, a detective, was hit hit and run just this past week by a girl who was uh, high on heroin. She had multiple stamp bags in the car. So uh, even even us, he's a victim of a crime right there. The police are a victim of a crime. The uh, the problem is that heroin, the precursor to, to heroin use is prescription drug abuse. Um, as as uh, a person gets introduced to an opiate type uh, painkiller um, and then chooses to, to try to acquire them through illegal channels or you know through the, the black market, uh, it becomes, it, it actually becomes a cost factor. They can buy prescription painkillers at X amount of dollars, if it's a 40 milligram pill, it may cost 20 on the street, a 60 milligram pill may cost 30 on the street. And then at some point they get introduced to heroin, which can be bought a lot cheaper. And, and uh, they start down that route of, of heroin. So. so are you saying that you can get prescription drugs through an insurance plan even, and then trade up to heroin? I mean, getting prescription drugs through an insurance plan, I mean, that's obviously one way that prescription drugs, you know, through legal channels, through somebody getting prescribed by a doctor through, you know, their health insurance, that's a way that it gets into the, to the black market and, and how that would, an example of how that would occur. You know, you're, you have that in the medicine cabinet because it was prescribed to you because you went to the doctor for some kind of slip and fall injury. So the, the doctor who has a duty of care you know, prescribes, you know, a Vicodin or a Percocet type drug, a, a heavy opiate, you know, 
narcotic painkiller. And unfortunately, if they sit around in the, in the medicine cabinets and they'll get used, you're going to have some kids that get introduced to the tendency to take those and they'll take them to the schools and we've had that and they start getting sold at schools or they get sold illegally. And of course, there are those people that try to abuse the prescription drug insurance plan system to acquire that and then they do sell that. I mean, it's a matter of you know, their income. So it, it, it's, it's multifaceted. You, have the, you, you can have the kids acquiring it through you know, their parents' medicine cabinets when the parents don't keep good control of that. And uh, you'll definitely have people that are, are, are you know, pursuing doctors. And unfortunately, there are doctors that are engaging in criminal activity right now, too. So, Tom, you, you have almost an intimidating law enforcement resume. Uh, can you share with us some of what you have seen over your 40 years in law enforcement uh, in terms of drug abuse and then kind of try to bring it back to what you see the root cause being? Well, the, the root cause is, is probably poverty mostly. I mean, a lot of times it's, uh, it's the poor sections of our, of our communities that, that you see the heaviest uh, drug use. Now that has changed over the years and it's starting to get into our middle class and upper class uh, schools and students uh, that are starting to use these drugs too that have been introduced to it. Uh, it's it's an easy, fun time, and so they take the easy way out. Uh, school today is stressful. It's not what you know. When I was a kid, we, you know, we, we didn't we didn't have the kind of, of uh, mathematics and things that they do in school today. But school is stressful. It's not, and our lives are stressful. Uh, just uh, our status in our among our students uh, can bring you down to uh, you know if you get picked on, it can bring you down to where you end up just starting to abuse drugs or somebody accuses you of it and you get the reputation for it, then you want to fill that reputation, so you start using drugs. Uh, when I was in homicide, I'd say, well, oh, oh, way over 50, 60 percent of our shootings and our killings were, were drug related. And, uh, and that continues today. It's, uh, it's a nasty thing that's, that's going on in our, in our community. It's something we have to get a handle on. Uh, and it starts uh, in prescription drugs is, is starting to become one of the major problems. Uh, as a senior citizen, I know that, uh, I always say, getting old is not for sissies. Uh, you start getting aches and pains and the doctor tries to help you out. And a lot of times you don't take all those drugs. And you leave them around the house, like I have grandkids, I gotta make sure my grandkids are coming over, I don't have those drugs laying around. You wouldn't leave a loaded weapon on your table, you shouldn't leave your narcotics on the table either. Uh, kids do know to take at uh, just read recently, now they're having what they call farm parties, where the kids just go home, they all grab different pills that they can from their, their grandparents, their parents, take them to a house for a party, they pour them all into a bowl and just take, take handfuls of pills. They have no idea what they're taking. And it's something that starts, it starts at home, and, and to, to stop this problem, it's going to have to start at home again. We so, have to start doing it. So what can we do? I think you've got to look in your... your uh, you've got to look at yourself and say, listen, you know, if I have drugs that I haven't used, I mean, you get pain pills, you go to a dentist, he gives you pain pills, he may give you 20, you only use 10, you leave 10 in, the, uh, in your medicine cabinet or on your kitchen counter or in your dresser in your bedroom, very easy access. You got to look and see where that is. If you're going to keep them and they haven't expired, then you got to lock them up like you do a weapon. You got to put them away where they cannot be found easily. Uh, and if they're expired, then you call your local police department and see what kind of programs available uh, to dispose of them properly. Chief, do, right. you, do you think that prescription drugs have, as, as Tom was saying, become somewhat of a weapon? Yeah, absolutely, because it just as he's, I mean, his analogy is perfect. You wouldn't leave that weapon sitting there, and that weapon can ruin your life and your family's life in a heartbeat if, if it, you know, if the wrong thing happens. Well, so can that prescription drug bottle sitting in that medicine cabinet that, you know, your child, for you know, God's sakes, decides that to, you know that they're going to go down that route and they're going to take that thing. There's maybe they take one or two, they take them out of there, and then it's you know, you know, one out of the bottle, and then you know they take them to their school or they get introduced to it from another person at school, and then they enter into that. They start down that path, and then once they start down that path, it doesn't mean everybody's going to you know fully go down that path. But unfortunately, we know that there are several people that do. A lot of people are. We we so. we hear. From people and I think there's a general perception that prescription drugs are always safe uh, because they're prescribed by a doctor. Uh, right. What what does 
what help does law enforcement need to try to resolve this problem? Is it is it is it just a law enforcement issue, or Not is it a all. treatment issue? Well, one, I would like to to put forth that, and I know that the AG's office is trying to do this right now, some education to the doctors. Doctors have a duty of care, and I imagine that every doc, most doctors out there are trying to, to do right by their patients. But just like in any walk of life, you're going to have, you know, you're going to have the dark doctors that are, you know, on the fringe or in the, you know, that are going to support the black market. And, and, but putting them aside, an example, there's a policeman that got a, a splinter in his foot, and he went to the emergency room, and they gave him a 30-day prescription of Percocets for a splinter in his foot that he just couldn't remove. Who doesn't need 30 days of Percocets for a splinter? But, I mean, it's being overprescribed. I mean, it, it is. So education of the doctors, I know the AG's office is working towards that. You know, support to that end would cut off some version of a supply where it's going to hit middle class America, where it's going to be in the medicine cabinet for the taking. Personal responsibility of the parents, you know, locking them up. Uh, using the prescription drug boxes that are now in the, you know, regularly in the county, the program that's you know, coming here in a couple of days. Uh, trying to educate the parents that way that, you know, I don't think a parent is going to necessarily see Tom's analogy that it is a loaded gun, but that is a good way of, 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 of putting that out there to people. So, you know, you deal with, you need dealing with the home, you're dealing with the doctors, and then as far as we're concerned, law enforcement, I mean, we have our hands full with it. We're dealing with it constantly. The majority of our, like I said, our, our criminal incidents are, are, are drug related. But if you put more and more policemen on the street, I, I don't know that that's going to change it. I mean, I really don't. Unfortunately, I, I equate it to almost at times like prohibition when we try to outlaw alcohol in this country. People want it that for some reason, and that's beyond me because I don't understand that, why people, they do and they want it. And, and if you could change people's way of thinking, I, I think that's really what somebody has to figure out. But I don't know how we do that. So. So what's your message to uh, a young adult, a teenager, a parent who thinks that either themselves or someone they know or love has a problem? What, what is your, what's your message to them? Can they come to you? Can they come to the, to the police department without fear of, uh, you know, just getting in trouble? If they want treatment, where, where do they need to go? What do they need to do to feel S safe? Speaking for my department, yes, they can come. To, I, I, my, my door is open. I give my cell phone out to more people than you know, I can imagine. And I got called, this, is, <laughs> this isn't for you know, video purposes, Good Friday afternoon, I'm in, out in the, after, in the yard playing with the kids, and I get a call from a guy that lives a half a mile from me and he's crying because his 30-year-old son is now on heroin, and he's asking what to do. You know, and I certainly didn't run right down there with my handcuffs and say, show me where he's at. You know, I'm trying to help them. They can absolutely come to us, and we'll try to refer them to counseling. You know, that is not my expertise, counseling. I can make those referrals, you know, but uh, I'm happy to do that. I would like to see them get better. If they need arrested, I mean, that is my job. That's the function I serve, and that's what I'm going to do. But, you know, if, if I can be of assistance to them getting help, certainly they can come to us. You know, and there's no, you know, fear of, you know, labeling or reprisal at that level. Tom, what, what would your message be? I, well, I think the message is it's got to start with family support, and you've got to get them into programs. Uh, you got to, first of all, you got to recognize that there's a problem. Sometimes parents, grandparents have a hard time recognizing. Uh, they go into denial, and uh, uh, the siblings go into denial, and everyone wants to uh, uh, try to say, oh, there's not really a problem. They're just having fun and uh, this and that, but that's, that's not the answer. The answer is to recognize there's a problem, uh, get the family support together, get them into a program. Some of these programs are very, very good, and they work and we have to use them and they're available. They're available all over. You can be referred to them by the police departments or, uh, or your doctor or even uh, mental health people or the family themselves can just take them, get them into a program. But uh, it starts with support. Well, thank you both so much for your time. You're I welcome. really appreciate it. You're welcome. You're welcome.